in order to understand quantum mechanics um, and the wave nature of matter, it's pretty important that we start understanding the wave nature of matter from a classical perspective. So first let's see how classical physicists described waves um, and then based on that it'll really help us understand how quantum mechanics people, they describe waves. So I'll begin off with an example. Uh, so let us consider a wave that we make by a rope. Pretend that we have a rope or a string that I tie one end of the rope here along x is equal to zero. I, I, I call this point x is equal to zero. And then on the other end I tie it along let's say a second wall um, and I call that x is equal to L. So I have some sort of boundary set up um, and in between that boundary I have a wave. So for terminology's sake, let's find out all the variables we have. I have an x variable, which is basically the distance along the horizontal axis. And then I have some variable u, and that's basically the height um, at any point along the x-axis. And then I also have this variable t time, um, and it just means that this wave can change as time goes on. So u depends on two variables, x and t, right? The value of u is different here at this value of x. It's different here at this value of x, and so forth. And as time goes on, we also assume that u changes value as well. So another thing you should know is that when u is a maximum, that means the biggest height um, that the string can take or the wave can take. It's called the amplitude of the wave um, and basically it's just u max. So it turns out that u x of t it satisfies <clears throat> um, some sort of differential equation. It satisfies this differential equation so it's really not important for us to um, kind of understand where I got this equation from. Uh, you all are taking quantum chemistry, so we'll try to keep a lot of the derivations to a minimum. We'll, we'll just try to cover the important parts. So all we need to know is that the height of this wave or this rope or this string, it satisfies this linear partial differential equation. Now, some important things to understand here is that this is a partial differential equation. What that means is u depends on x and t, right? So here, um, u here is only dependent on x and u here is only dependent on t. So it's a partial differential equation because u is supposed to depend on x and t, but here I only have u being dependent on x and here I have it dependent on t. So we're taking something called a partial differential. If there was only one variable that u depended on, then I would just call it an ordinary differential equation. So to signify that this is a partial differential equation, I put this weird looking d. So whenever you see that d, it just means that u depends on more variables than what you see down here. Okay? So the thing is, is that we don't really like dealing with partial differential equations. So somehow we have to make this into an ordinary differential equation. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that soon enough. Now, Another thing we should talk about is that u is the dependent variable. It, its value depends on the values of x and t, right? So x and t here are our independent variables. You see x and t can change, and depending on that, u changes as well. So we also, whenever we have partial differential equations, it's very important to set up something called a boundary condition. Um, without boundary conditions, it's very hard to solve partial differential equations. So boundary conditions are basically how the physical system is set up. 
um, when you do problems like this many times, boundary uh, conditions will become very easy for you to identify. So here the boundary uh, condition is this. Um, I have one boundary at x is equal to 0 and I have another boundary at x is equal to L. The important thing is at both of these points 0 and L, the value of u is equal to 0. That means the string has 0 height. Um, and it doesn't matter what value t takes on. If I'm standing in this system for 10 years, 100 years, or a billion years, I've set up the system in this manner that at those two ends, u will always be 0. Now moving on, uh, it turns out that we can solve this equation, this equation, for u x of t by a special method and it's called separation of variables. Now it's very important that you follow along and you try to understand this method because along all throughout quantum mechanics we'll be using separation of variables quite a bit so it's, it's important that we understand what this method is all about. Now the key step for separation of variables is this. We assume that u x of t can be separated or factorized into two components. It can be factorized into a component that just depends on one variable, which in our case is x, and then it can also be factorized, factorized into another, which just depends on t. So if I multiply these two components together, I get the whole function that I'm interested in, u x of t. So most of the times when we have partial differential equations, we're going to have to solve it one by one. We're going to have to solve it one independent variable at a time because if you do it two independent variables at a time, it, it becomes almost impossible to solve the equation. So this is really important um, and it might seem daunting at first, but don't worry. Once you do this one, one or two times, this isn't really that hard. Okay. So, now I know that u x of t can be written um, as two factors multiplied together, x of x and t of t. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to substitute that into my parent equation, which is this. When I do that, right, I get this and this. So all I did is I substituted u with the two factors. Now, in this part of the derivative, the derivative only depends on x. That means we can treat t like a constant and we can pull it out. Similarly here, the derivative only depends on t. So then I can bring out x and treat it like kind of a constant here because d here, we assume that it only depends on one of the variables. So the other I can just pull out. So that's what I just did in this step. Um, for this one, I say that t kind of acts like a um, constant, so I pull it out and I'm left with only x terms. And here I say that, um, you know, x acts like a constant because this derivative only acts on t. Now, something interesting happened. When I did this, this derivative it only depends on x, this derivative only depends on t, so this is something that I call an ordinary differential equation. So this is ordinary, this is the differential that we are used to seeing, right? This looks like a normal d that we are used to seeing. Okay, so far so good, nothing too hard, all I said is u can be factorized into two components, one that depends on one variable x and the other that depends on the other variable t. And then I went and I substituted u with that. Okay, so now you know the drill, we have to collect like terms. So when I do that, I can, I can bring this x to this side and it goes on the bottom of the equation and this t I can bring it to the other side and it goes on the bottom with t or I mean sorry with v. Okay so when I do that I'm left with this equation 1 over x of x times this differential is equal to this guy times that differential. 
Now here's the catch. X and T are both independent variables. That means they don't like they don't their value doesn't depend on the value of u, right? Time will continue to go on. It doesn't matter what height the um, wave takes. Time will continue to go on on its own pace. So T and X are kind of like independent variables. But the important thing is for both of these equations to be equal, right? For both of them to be equal to each other, as this suggests. Um, they have to equal to the same number, okay? So I'm going to say that they're both equal to some number k, that both of these equations end up equaling to some number k. It could be 10, 20, 1, 2, doesn't matter what it is. It could even be a negative number, but I'm just saying that it equals to some number k. When I do that, I can separate both of the equations, okay? I can say that this guy, it's equal to k, and similarly, the t terms are also equal to k. And k is called the separation constant, and we have to find it out. So now, I'm going to rewrite the equations um, so that I get everything on one side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move this x along with k, and I'm going to move this v squared times t along with k, and then I'm going to bring them all to one side. So you can figure out that math yourself. It's really not that hard. Um, all I did is I cross multiplied and then I brought it to the other side. So I'm left with this equation and this equation. Okay? So these are called ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients. This constant coefficient negative k and negative kv squared, they're constants. They don't change their values. Okay, so that makes our life a lot easier. From the first equation, I can find out x of x. From the second equation, I can find out t of t. And then once I have those two quantities, I can multiply them to get u x of t, and that's what I'm looking for. So uh, hopefully you're following along and you realize that really the whole issue is that we have to solve these equations one by one for each variable. Now let's find k. So if we can find k then we can easily find x of x and t of t. It turns out that k can have three values, right? It can either be zero k can be a positive number, which means it's greater than 0, right? Um, or it could be some negative number um, that's less than 0.